Okay, the brain, the way that it works is it's not like it's, a, it's this gradual growth over time. It functions in spurts, and so we're going to talk about those different spurts. The first spurt we've always known about. You know, we thought, okay, if we do whatever we can for the baby in utero and for the first two years, we're good to go. Then that baby's kind of set for life. So the first growth spurt starts at it from about, like I said, in utero to 18 months. And so there is much value in regards to, um, you know, how much sensory exposure do you provide the kid up to 18 months? Because they have this huge growth spurt in regards to brain cell development, the amount of information that they're, they're taking in, um, and how the cells are beginning to connect, and the neurons that are connecting those, those different cells. What we see in regards to the second growth spurt, physical spurt of increase in cell development, is during the 10 to 13 year of age. See, the, it's interesting though, because at the 10 to 13 year of age, you don't see a lot of the emotional drama that you do when you get to 13-ish, although that's kind of dropping. And, and you don't see, you know, like the young age where they're battling for it. What, there's a term for the 10, 10 years old, it's like latency age, you know, preteen age, and there's a reason for that term because they tend to be pretty settled. But what you will see during that time is the increased cell development. What you see after those times of overproduction are the pruning and the organizing. And this is what's really kind of critical. It's not so much the cell development, although we'll talk about that, but what the brain does once the cells are developed. And the way that the brain works is it's really a use it or lose it kind of concept. If it's not stimulated, the brain says, well, I don't want to waste energy in supporting that function or supporting that brain cell. I'm going to let it go. So think about it. If you have overproduction at 10 to 13 years of age, when are you going to need to be stimulating this child as much as possible? During the kind of the 10 to 13, 15, 16 years of age, you want to try to increase stimulation, increase exposure to different events. Um, just like you would do, and we all do, we seem to, at the 18-month stage. You know, we have all those great toys for kids when they're young in regards to, you know, we're going to do black and red, or we're going to play the music, or we're going to read lots of books. Do we have that same focus on kids around this age? Do we give them that opportunity? We say they're done, right? But we have all of, we have huge, you know, uh, toy companies that focus on the development during this stage, making tons of money in regards to how to enhance the stimulation for these kids. We need to kind of think about, are we doing the same thing for this age? So we'll talk a little bit about what are ways to kind of stimulate kids and improve their thinking during that age. But remember, what part of the brain is still being developed during this stage? So it's not like we want to buy them books and toys to kind of stimulate them during the, you know, after the 13 year of age, but what can we do to give these kids opportunities to stimulate that frontal lobe, the decision making, the planning, the memory, the impulse control. And the hard part is, I said, instead of trying to find ways to stimulate that, we have expectation that those things are occurring at that age. Does that make sense? So we're expecting decision making, planning, memory, and impulse control. When the opposite should be occurring, we should be giving them opportunities to have trial and error during those stages. I've mentioned a bit in the presentations about white matter and gray matter. I just want to kind of explain that briefly, what that is. The gray matter is actually the part of the brain that's actually doing the thinking. And like I told you in the slides, there are several areas of development where the gray matter is still growing. The white matter is the area on the outside of the brain. The gray matter is on the inside. The white matter is on the outside. That's the part of the brain that's sending the messages where they need to go. It's coordinating the message sending. And so what we see is for the white matter, that continues into middle age. So even though the brain, the gray matter, the thinking part of the brain has been established pretty early on, like early 20s, the white matter continues to grow into middle age. So even though you may have a limited number of cells that can do problem solving, do you have the cells, what I'm saying is that you can still develop the cells that coordinate the problem solving, problem solve more efficiently, be able to communicate the problem solving and pull in information in order to better problem solve. All right, so what we've confirmed is basically that brain development continues to 21, I'd say about 24 or 25, and that with the frontal lobe, these are the areas of the brain that we're going to primarily focus on when it comes to adolescent development. Those that do executive functioning, those that do planning, those that do reasoning and impulse control. Because those are what I normally hear are the struggle for most, is that we see this grown child in front of us that's doing none of these things. What is executive functioning? 
Because I think it's important. We, I hear the term executive functioning used a lot. I thought it'd be important to break it down, kind of help you understand what are the components of executive functioning. The first thing is working memory and recall. And that's, that's critical. If you think about it, we as adults rely on our past, on our experiences. Maybe not that we've personally experienced, but someone has told us about what we've learned. Are you able to pull that information and manipulate it, look at it, evaluate it, to make a current decision? So that's part of executive functioning. Uh, but you have to hold on to that information. You have to be able to attend to that information. You can't just, um, you ha does that make sense? You can't just rely that the correct information is going to come to you. You have to be able to look at all of these memories or all these situations that I've been exposed to in the past and what is relevant for this situation. Then there's just the sheer fact of activation or arousal. You know, turning yourself on to go, okay, wait, I need to stop and think about this. And how well do teenagers stop and think? Yeah, right. right, hardly, right? It's like, what? Stop? So, how, you know, much, much less think, they don't stop and kind of focus, you know, and, and that's kind of a word that you want to say, you know, you kind of shake them. What were you thinking? You know, why didn't you stop for a second? That, that shaking is activation and arousal. But you know that moment that you're like, what were you thinking? That's the activation and arousal that your internal brain is doing, not only for yourself, but hopefully for the kid that you're working with. Um, so that's what you kind of think about. The activation arousal is that shaking moment. And it's the, the keeping them focused. You know, it's not just... We see a lot of kids that have really good intentions. You know, they'll, okay, I'm going to do this. And then they leave your office. You know, you, they go back to class. And the next time you see them, you're like, what happened? I don't know, miss. You know, so it's staying focused. How do you get them to stay focused? That is the activation and arousal. When we talk about controlling emotions... That is part of executive functioning in that you're able to make decisions despite it being an emotionally laden situation. And what is probably, when it comes to teens, what drives most of their emotions? Feelings? Yeah, feelings. What were you saying? Boyfriends, relationships, right? And it can vary from one week to the next. You know, one week on the girl's notebook, I love John, I love John, John this, John squiggly this, John da 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 da, she's writing his name over, John, you know, Vasquez over and over and over again. And the next week, all those pages are ripped out of the book, and it's Carlos, I love Carlos, da 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 And, you know, I'm like, girl, you have to get a new notebook because you've run out of places on this one. To, but does that make sense? So it's, what drives a lot of emotion is that intense kind of feeling about relationships. How do we, when it comes to executive functioning, how do we instill that ability to control emotions? The ability to wait, to delay gratification. And is there much delayed gratification when it comes to I love Carlos or I love John or, no, the next thing you know, you're like, you, you what? You, you, went, you slept with him? You know, it's kind of, do they wait that time period to kind of see, is, is this the right person? You know, and the reality is, do you know many adults, I mean, how many adults kind of are able, she's laughing. I mean, we do the same with adults. You know, we, we're driven, emotions is the most difficult thing, I think, to regulate in regards to executive functioning. We can teach planning, we can teach, you know, stop and think for a second, but when it comes to those emotionally laden situations, I mean, that's why we see kind of the challenges in relationships that we do even in the adult world, because emotions drive kind of our decision making. Then there's an internalizing language. You know, do our kids use self-talk? No, no. Do they, I mean, the voice that's in their head, and not the one that requires the medication, but the voice that's in their head that, do they have a good voice? Do they have a voice that's able to reassure them, to able to talk them into delayed gratification? And do you guys, I mean, when you think about yourself, do you think that you have a voice? Like, she was very good at listing all those things about what to think about before you get into a car. And that's your voice. I mean, your voice is probably asking you that. Wait, are you really going to do that without knowing this or that? I mean, do you have that voice instilled in you, and is there a way to do that in regards to with our kids? And so that's an aspect of executive functioning. The other thing that we talk about is our children, as part of executive functioning, are they able to take apart a part of situation? Because most decision making is not black and white, is it? There's some good things and some bad things about any situation, and especially when it comes to peer relationships, um, you know, social situations. You know, there's all of these very emotionally compelling reasons to do what you want to do, are you able to break those apart? You know, God, he's so cute, but he broke up with my friend last week. You know, are you able to kind of split those, you know, pieces apart and look at a situation clearly? And what we see that a lot of times is that aspect of executive functioning is not present. 
Okay, so someone who's got strong executive functioning is going to do this. They're going to make good use of past knowledge. Is that fair to say that? And it's not just, like I said, their own personal experience. I know we say, you know, you have to do it to learn it. I mean, there is the ability to learn from your parents' advice. There is the ability to learn from reading. You know, is the person able to not only learn from their own experiences? Because that would, we would be in big trouble if everyone had to learn, don't mess with fire the hard way. Fair to say that? So we are able to learn um, by kind of hearing stories. So are they able to use past knowledge in a good way? And when it comes to, are they able to, in current situations, know what's expected of them? And take a step back and look at, you know, not just the pros and cons, but what do others expect of me? And many of you function more as mentors. Is that fair to say that? Or as role models, or as kind of, you provide opportunities for them to see role modeling, and you also provide opportunities for them to know that you have high expectations. And is there a way for kids with strong executive functioning, can we develop a way for them to instill those high expectations in themselves? So when they walk into a situation, they know that, you know, I'm better than this. You know, I, I have much more potential that's worth much more than the risk I'm about to take. Okay, so other aspects of strong executive functioning are they think about the things that they're doing, and so they break it down. If I get into this car, what's going to happen to me? If I sleep with this guy, what's going to happen to me? Um, and they can kind of take a look at, they recognize their emotions also. Yeah, you know, he's really hot, but I know I just like him because he's really hot. I know there's no chance for a future. How many of the girls that you work with can take a step back and really lay out that situation and go, break apart, he's really hot, but that doesn't mean he's going to be with me forever. Right. That's an, a sign of, how many women do you know can do that? <laughs> he's really hot, but, I, but that's a sign of really strong executive functioning. And then the other side of strong executive functioning is that there's the, the ability to change. And we see that both in children and in adults. You know, we finally make a decision and we don't waver even though the situation has altered down the road. So we, this is the decision we're going to do, we're going to do it this way, and we don't move. And so the sign of a strong executive functioning is that, yes, I've decided I'm going to get in the car, because it looks okay, you know, it's mom's car, they got approval from mom, you know, it, oh, I know everybody in the car, we're going to go down to Fiesta. So let's say they get to Fiesta and somebody joins them that they know is not good. Are they able to say, okay, I'm not going to go home with them, I'm going to call my mom, or they say, well, you know, I rode down there with them, I need to ride back, even though I know this person is a bad person. Can they switch once they get started in a road, on a path? And then again, the huge part of strong executive functioning is delaying gratification and adjusting when the rules change kind of unexpectedly. So what are challenges to executive functioning? And these are kind of, I think, what brings a lot of people to trainings like this is the kids that have challenges. So I'm going to kind of lay out what I think are challenges to executive functioning, and y'all just may nod. Please add in when you feel like I've missed something. So uh, someone who's struggling with executive functioning is someone that has difficulty planning. Any of you experienced kids like that? They've got a book report due. They've been told this book report was due a month ago. And when do they do it? The night before. And the book report actually requires that you're going to do a physical presentation. It's going to need poster board, right? All of those things. And you've made the decision you're going to start your book report at 9.50 at night. And now everything's closed. So again, it's going to require planning. Um, but these are what I'm giving you with this are indicators that maybe a child's executive functioning is not strong. So, okay, so one of the challenges to executive functioning is the planning um, and taking how much time it will take to complete. Just even working with the kids that you're working with, are they cap able to tell a story? Can they tell a story from beginning to end? Are they able to kind of format, kind of, just, you know, weave in? They, they may digress because they're teenagers, so they may go, you know, well, you know, yesterday I was talking to so-and-so, and he is so cute, and da-da-da-da-da-da. And then they go back to, okay, well, we were talking about going to Fiesta, and they were saying that they're going to have mom's car, you know, and, oh, God, I wish I had a car. My parents won't let me have a car. So they've digressed from the conversation a little bit, but then they go back to, okay, so they're going to have a car, and so-and-so is going, and so-and-so is going, oh, did you know so-and-so did this the other day? And so, okay, then they dropped off the conversation again, right? Have you had these conversations with the kids, and you're like, focus, focus. 
So, okay, so they, they go like this, but they're able to eventually get to the end. If you want to kind of test, does a child have, the, you know, kind of executive functioning abilities, have them tell a story. You know, are they able to get to the end within a decent time frame? If, interestingly, also see if they can do it not just verbally, because we have a lot of kids that we work with have decent verbal skills, but are they able to do it in writing? Are they able to, not that their words have to be perfectly spelled, not that their writing, their grammar has to be perfect, but are they able to lay out a story for you with a timeline, you know, for chronologically, with a beginning, middle, and an end? And it'll be interesting, I mean, that's just kind of a test. You know, does this child need development and being able to do that? If they can do it verbally but not written, then it may be something else. But if they struggle doing it in both ways, how are they going to walk through and make decisions? So let's also look at some other challenges. They have trouble communicating details in an organized manner. And again, that's kind of like that story idea. You know, can they lay it out for you in kind of an organized way? And they have a, often have ta trouble with just memorization. They, they can, certain things they can recall, you know, we joke, well, they can recall a rap song, no problem, or they can tell you how to get to level X with no problem. But, you know, those are, a lot of those are very highly stimulated situations that there's tons of different ways that they're learning that information. Are they able to kind of pull information from you from memory, just kind of just bland information, phone numbers, you know, what happened yesterday, that kind of thing. And that's very, it'll be very telling for you. Okay, do they have trouble just even getting started? And this could be a lot of things. It's not solely executive functioning, but it could be a warning sign that they may be struggling with executive functioning. It could be also a warning sign that they have trouble, you know, with comprehension or they may have some anxiety or performance anxiety that, you know, if I start this, I'm going to fail it anyway, so why bother even getting started? So don't think that this is solely diagnosing someone who's got executive functioning, but it will help you to kind of look at, do they have trouble kicking it off? Uh, and a lot of times they have trouble starting it because they have trouble planning and it winds up blowing up in their face anyway. So it's more of kind of a, a warning sign. And do they have trouble kind of holding on to information? 